that you might be thinking if you know it properly or not. Okay, whenever you are ready, Harpit. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So what what do you what have you understood about human evolution already? So like I basically read some NCRT. So mm -hmm. I so like I what I understood was that we knew that uh, 15 million years ago we got mm -hmm. to know about that there was some more ape like structure uh ever found which are known as diatoxic mm -hmm. and the Rana more man-like structure. How do you so, know how do we know this? Nick, is, okay. could be just a story, right? Someone just made it up. What are the evidences? So 15, you say 15 million years ago. So 15 million years ago, no one know what was happening. There is only one way to go back in time and know what kind of thing existed. And what is that? The fossil. Yes. So there are fossil records which are as old as 15 million years ago and some of the time most of the times actually they are not complete like skeleton from tip to toe but fairly conserved sorry fairly preserved um, fossil records with matching structures to current ape-like or human-like body parts so through this fossil records we know that earliest around 15 million years ago there were primates of two kinds Dio like one lineage was dryopithecus and the other lineage was ramopithecus earlier people used to believe or the way it was taught in evolution textbooks was that ramopithecus came out of dryopithecus and still like many students who just study ncrt and not does not know or does not read properly or does not know in detail uh, thinks that it is a linear evolutionary chain from dryopithecus to ramopithecus australopithecus and things like that but that's not entirely true right yes your voice is uh, breaking up within between can you can you say again Then now I am audible. Yes, you are audible now. Perfect. Yeah, I was saying like I understood the same we were telling, sir, because I was absent in the evolution classes. Like they are in the series uh, from the Dryopithecus to Ramopithecus, then to. Right, right. So that's that's the in general, um, many students understand it like this, and partly not students' fault because even teachers don't understand evolution properly, and often end up teaching it in a linear fashion. There was no, so. The one thing that we know from this chapter is that there was branching descent, right? It was never like there was a linear fashion of organisms. There is so much of diversity. It could never occur if there is just linear fashion of speciation from one to another and another and another. So all the ape-like, even all the apes which we have today. So if I ask you whether a chimpanzee is more evolved or a human is more evolved, if you do not understand evolution, you might end up saying that human is more evolved, right? Exactly. Yes, sir. Yeah, but that's not true. A chimpanzee is as evolved as a human because uh, we, we, we both, the lineages of human-like and ape-like started around 15 million years ago. So the apes, monkeys, baboons, chimpanzees of today are as evolved as humans but they just evolved to become chimpanzees. We evolved to become humans. It's never like we have evolved from chimpanzees. So all the chimpanzees or all the monkeys will one day become humans. That's not going to happen. Okay. Speciation doesn't work like that. So that is one of the most common and the most standing myth about evolution that even... Well, even... In my school also, so the teacher like told in the same way, like we evolved from mm -hmm. the chimpanzees, apes. We never evolved from chimpanzees. So 
the question could be that will one day all the chimpanzees vanish and everyone will become human right no right chimpanzees yes. are chimpanzees are as evolved as we are for that matter any organism plants are as evolved as we are because they are also evolving with time we are also evolving with time we are different they are different organisms that's the whole point about biodiversity what does happen is that humans and chimpanzees had a common ancestor okay at one point of time chimpanzees and humans shared a common ancestor by that i mean during that period there was no human and no chimpanzee only a common ancestor a group of population of an of a of a organism which was ape like and that then diverged due to geographical isolation due to um habitat due to mutations recombination speciation happened one group diverged to go to the grasslands and started living in grasslands tried to stand erect started hunting millions of years later that evolved into completely a different kind of organism uh, very less hairs on the body hands more free to do tasks uh, body structure slightly changed but overall anatomy as same as chimpanzees the other group went to the forests became um, what do you say arboreal means living on the trees and you know using their hands and legs to quickly go up and down the trees sleeping on branches so they did not evolve uh, the structure to stand erect all the time because they did not need that more hair on the body because their hands were not that free to use tools relatively freer than monkeys and other uh, apes but chimpanzees are very much human like but still humans are very different from chimpanzees right so yes so there was adaptive radiation in that region like they separated into grasslands and to uh, the places so uh, adaptive radiation the concept of adaptive radiation you can you can say in a manner but uh, all the primates basically if you if you look at primates for that matter primates kind of diverged from a common ancestor but also in different time period okay so that also is an important factor to we are not very sure that whether there was just a adaptive radiation happening or it was a gradual over the time change in the climatic conditions and uh, migration so uh, migration also helps in adaptive radiation but we still are uh, figuring out new evidences are coming out about human evolution every so we just study a handful of human species right like homo species under the genus homo we know about homo erectus homo habilis homo neanderthals and uh, homo sapiens right there were many homo devsonian homo ergaster all these are not taught to you in the textbooks and because these are uh, recent evidences in the last 10 years that we have figured out there were many species of humans homo sapiens living on the planet at one point of time okay back around um around 1 lakh years ago or 2 lakhs years ago and these species because they were very similar but with slight variations just like there are many species of leo leo is the genus right where lions tigers le leopards cheetah all come in right so leo tigris leo pardus you know all these are there so homo sapiens homo ergaster uh, homo devsonian they were all sharing niche and they constantly used to compete for the similar resources we just out competed all of them we means homo sapiens out competed all of them because we were more intelligent if not more um, stronger i will say but we were we were better with our cognitive capability we made tools we made we started using tools to hunt to fight we started using fire for our own benefit and that's where things started going down for those species and we out competed them <clears throat> homo sapiens flourished another homo species became extinct okay and how do we know this because if there was a linear fashion of evolution let's say from species 1 
came species two strictly, and then came species three. So let's say if this was ten million years ago, okay? Are you paying attention, Arpit? You're there with me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. So how how so it is it will only make sense that species two fossils you will found around let's say five million years ago, right? Yes. Sir. Recent, and then species three will be around one million year ago. Yes. Then only you can say that there was a series, right, of speciation from one to another, because by the time second got selected because of speciation event, let's say the second species came, and that was better fit to survive, so that will be selected by nature, and this one will go extinct, right? Then they will rule. Yes. Again, there will be another speciation, and the third species will be better fit, so that will survive. The second will go extinct, right? Yes, sir. So this is what. People used to believe about human evolution long back, but then they started finding evidences uh, during the same time period. So, if I say that around ten million years ago, you find species one, and you also find species three at the same time, now that tells us that it could not be a direct, uh, it could not be a series, right? If species one and three lived at the same time. Then three did not came from one, right? They both came together from something. Isn't yes, it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Exactly. Makes sense to you or not? Yes, sir. It's clear. Yeah. So if I find two fossils, do their dating, and realize that oh, these two fossils belong to the similar era, and it's not possible, even if there is a difference of difference of let let's say, um, um, one million year or with a with a <clears throat> what do you say, error of plus minus twenty. Uh, thousand years, so you will realize that it's not possible for these two species to uh, bifurcate from one another so fast. So maybe they both came from. Oh, I lost internet. Am I am I still audible to you? Yes, sir, you are. Okay, perfect. So my internet is not gone, but I lost electricity in my room. It will be back in a minute. Okay, no problem. Okay. Right, it's, back. it's back. Perfect. So it just tells us that it's more complicated than we think. So through this kind of evidences, we now know that at one point of time there were multiple human species, Homo species, um, living on the Earth. So human evolution starts. The earliest evidences that we have is 50, around 15 million years ago. The primates diverged into two branches: Dryopithecus and Ramapithecus. Dryopithecus were more ape-like, so we don't follow their um, ancestry and evolution, and we, you just know about Dryopithecus, they were more ape-like, that's it. Ramapithecus were more human-like. Now, what do I mean by more human-like is bones. So if you, if you still see apes and humans, our anatomy is, uh, our overall body structure is very same, but there are subtle differences in our anatomies and our skeleton. If you have seen a uh, ape, oh, sorry, a, a chimpanzee or a silverback ape. So you will see that their forelimbs are much stronger and bigger compared to their hind limbs, right? That is the reason they always have to be bent and walk using all the four limbs, right? Yes. They cannot stand as erect as we can because our legs have grown longer, our hands are comparatively shorter than our legs, and we can stand erect. So these kind of subtle differences you will find in our in our uh, anatomy and bone structure. Also the pelvic girdle. So why can't chimpanzees always move? So if you must have seen, chim chim you must have seen chimpanzees in some videos or some uh, some places, they, they have this capability to stand on two feet and walk. In the movie, War for the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, right, right, right. So they can walk, but they cannot walk for longer distances uh, on two, you know? Even in War of the Planet of Apes, you will see that often they come on their four feet yes. and they use their knuckles. So their fingers are on the opposite side, you know, like our, you will see that our finger has skin on the opposite side, lots of folds, but there, these knuckles are padded. This is a yes. proof that they use it to walk. So when you keep it on the ground, it has to be padded so that you don't, you know, harm, uh, what do you say, injure yourself. So the knuckles are padded, not only the front part. <clears throat> for humans, it is not the case. We can walk on two foot for very long distances. That is what led to the expansion of humans 
and chimpanzees restricted to forests. So you will not find chimpanzees everywhere. You will only find chimpanzees in dense tree forests, right? Because yes. they are tree dwellers. But humans are grassland dwellers. You will find them everywhere because they could walk very long distances. Okay. So on the basis of that, we started realizing that human-like were Ramapithecus. They had human-like bones and their fossils were found around three, from 15 million years ago to three to four, very recent, like three to four million years ago, you also you will find more and more human-like fossils. And then they named it Australopithecus. So Australopithecus, in a way, are the second descendants from Ramapithecus that led to human homo sapiens evolution. So they are our ancestors. They were very, very short-heighted because they were like apes and monkeys. So they were very, very short-heighted. And still there is no concept of human yet. We call it human-like just to keep you a give you a context that what they used to look like. Less like apes, more like humans. But still, when I say human, if you see a Australopithecus fossil, you will say that this doesn't look like a human. But I'm not just saying morphologically, I'm also saying anatomically compared to the ape-like ancestors. So Australopithecus were mostly fruit eaters. They were vegetarians because by that time, uh, mammals, especially these primates, were not that good in hunting. You know, uh, it took them time to learn weaponry and hunting because if you see humans, or if you see chimpanzees, chimpanzees have a lot of force. They are very huge, big, well-built. A chimpanzee can just uh, kill a human with just a punch. Okay. Yes. So they are very, very powerful. But these ancestors, Australopithecus, Ramapithecus, they were short. They were not very powerful. So they were also not very good hunters. Okay. And at that time, mammals like tigers and the fam tiger family still used to rule most of because dinosaurs were gone and mammals rose. So if dinosaurs were not extinct, mammals would have never rose, like uh, taken their place as the apex predators. So Australopithecus majorly were fruit eaters. Now, how do we know they were fruit eaters? You know, every point is worth questioning in science. Just by looking at fossil, can you tell, is it, is it even possible to tell that they were fruit eaters? No, sir. No, it is. So yeah. At the time, they did not have skill to hunt how do we know that? So that is, the, that is the retrospective supporting evidence that we have prepared as a logic because they were short statured and they, they were not very fast. Well, they were because also... cranial capacity was less. Because cranial capacity was less. We can see their skull size was very small. Second thing, they were also not on their two feet. So neither Ramapithecus nor Australopithecus could walk. They were not bipedal. They still used to walk on all the four limbs. So it's obvious that if you see nature, you will derive logic. If you use all your four limbs to walk or run, then the only thing with which you can hunt is your jaw, right? That is what tigers do. Yes, sir. Right? But Australopithecus did not even had a very, very promising jaw, right? Yes, so it sir. makes sense that they were not good hunters. Their hands were not free to hunt or make weapons. They used to all the four, plus their jaws were also very normal. So what they could have lived a life like is herbivore. So they were herbivores. They were fruit eaters. Okay. Why fruit? Why not grasses? Is because the home, if you see, um, first evidence can come from the jaw. If you see the jaws of a herbivore cattle, the kind of teeth which are there in the jaws, you will not find canines and incisors. You will only find molar-like teeth, which is used to chew the grass and the leaves, you know, just grind them. Because uh, cattle don't tear anything. Flesh-eating organisms have to tear through the flesh, right? Tear the flesh out of bones. Make sense? Yeah. So looking at the jaw, you can tell that what their predominant diet would have been. Okay. So they were majorly fruit eaters. From Australopithecus came Homo habilis, okay? And Homo habilis were the first Homo genus, okay? And this is the tree that I used in the class. I think you missed this class, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so now look carefully. Let me delete all of these things. 
let me just <clears throat> and we'll go through this graph it's a very good i've taken it from uh, encyclopedia britannica this image i think this image should be in ncrt but it's not it's because that clears a lot of things they like to complicate things i think they like to keep it very simple that's why that that's why they do not tell the whole truth <laughs> because the truth is complicated not the it's not plain let me first clear everything then we'll go through it okay now let me give you a couple of minutes on your own first to just look at all the corners everything what is all marked everything in this image take 3 minutes okay okay yes, sir. try to imbibe this image try to understand of uh, on your own if at all you can, if even if you can understand one theme or one thing or one sentence that's amazing so 3 minutes for you just look at it so this black region it depicts that it is empty you mean in the skull yeah yeah so the black part is where the, these bones are missing only the golden part are the bones which are found in fossil records so the black bones are missing so they are predicted structures but on logic so like in this yeah. uh, so did you did you understand yes sir hmm. so what i have observed is like as the the brain capacity is increasing Perfect. so this structure is like becoming so let's, more whenever we whenever we see a figure and if it is in a graph manner so let's first define the y and the x axis so the x axis is so the cranial capacity cranial capacity in cubic centimeters okay and the y axis is so the years time million of years ago so at the top is the present right zero yes. zero tells you about the this is around the present and at the bottom is 4 million years ago okay so remember i already told you 4 million years ago around 3 to 4 million years ago human like bones are found from ethiopia and tanzania these are african countries so that's where we believe so you must have heard this thing that africa is from where humans evolved yes sir right that's true that's true because of the earliest human like bones you find nowhere else on the planet just in africa so for every species the evolution must happen somewhere right some point then it diverges from there okay what you can call as adaptive radiation then but yes so x and y axis are clear then so uh, sir so as the i was saying that as the cranial capacity is increasing mm -hmm. so the structure is like becoming more you know defined and we are able to discover more the structures of the skull you mean to say uh, as we go as we go up in time yeah. we have better fossils yes yes complete fossils i mean yeah but that's not true actually so but like initially this structure didn't look like humans, humans. exactly yeah. they were more so another thing to worry is to look at it look at the present chart here at zero do you see this point yes sir and this point 
these two points are reference skulls for chimpanzee, pan troglodytes, and gorilla. Okay. So look at chimpanzee skull and look at a homo sapien human. So human also is present, right? Can you see it touches the present yes. line? Yes, sir. Yeah. I don't know for how long we are surviving, but still. So look at these three, chimpanzee, gorilla, and a human skull. Can you find any difference between these three skulls? So the second didn't look much similar to the, the gorilla one. Okay. Its jaw is very large. Which one looks, which one looks more like which one? Sir, the chimpanzees look similar to Homo sapiens, like present. Chimpanzee looks more similar to Homo sapiens. Correct. You're right. Do you see this bulge, this uh, obnoxiously big head? So if I cut it into two parts, the skull of yes. all here, you know, can you see I have cut the skull into two parts, divided. This is the face, okay? Yeah. The face side and the brain side, let's say. So look at the face side. The face side just have some differences in the teeth. That's because of the feeding habits, you know. So these are yeah. some bulged teeth. Humans have not get gotten rid of these big teeth. Actually, you will see that we also have canines. Yes. They're not as prominent as a as a tiger or, or a chimpanzee, but we do have canines. Yes. But our snout, the face seems to have gotten a little inside, our teeth a little, you know, tapered and measured, let's say. Yeah. But what's common is the eye, eyes are front facing. We also have that. Yes. And the nose groove, we also have that. Okay. But what's the major difference? Even, even if you look at the mandible and maxilla, their maxilla is attached here also, here also. We also have attached maxil. The mandible, which is the lower jaw, is free and it is big. So if you see, the mandible is fairly conserved, like, uh, conserved as a structure in all, right? But look at the brain part. What do you see? Can you see that for a face, which is very small, we have a very big head, very big brain compared? Yes, sir. Exactly opposite to gorilla. For a very big face, gorilla have a very small brain. Yes, sir. For a very small face, we have a very big brain. Exactly. So in the skull, the major part is actually taken by the brain. That 1 to 1.5 kg of the organ sits here in this cavity. And that's where we have a forehead. You will see that there is no concept of forehead in a gorilla. Yes, so. Right? Also, there is no, or I, I can say one or two head, not four. So how I measure it is this is four, four fingers. This is not where it comes from, but just to give you a context. Chimpanzee has a very small forehead. Gorillas almost have no forehead. Another difference is this eyebrow ridge. Can you see a very prominent ridge here? Yes, sir. Also present in chimpanzees, less prominent in humans, right? Yes, so sir. these features make a human face more human-like. So when we train any, any uh, artificial intelligence software, to recognize facials. You, you know there are face recognition softwares yeah. that checks in the database. So how do they recognize faces? So these are the features we feed in the, that if the distance between eyebrows is this much and the eyes are of this shape, bulged out or inside, the eyebrow ridge is prominent or not. This is how we describe facial features. So if you see the facial features are very different. Also, Homo sapiens have a big head. Gorilla has very small compared to the face. And chimpanzees lie in between, right? They have okay, okay head, okay-ish brain as compared to their face, right? Yes, sir. There is a difference. Now, knowing that all these present species, let's now go and look into the evolution evidences from the past. Let's go towards like from bottom to up. So around 4 million years ago, you will see that which is the first, this one, this line is the first one, right? Can you see that? Yes, sir, yes, sir. So these green lines tell 
that this species fossils starts from here and goes till this point. After this, you do not find this species fossil. What does it mean? This species got extinct after this point, right? Yeah. And around 3 million years ago. And what is this species? This species okay. is this one. Can you see the line? This one? Yes, sir. It's Australopithecus afarensis. So, Australopithecus. Yeah, Australopithecus is a genus. It is not a species. Okay. So you will find multiple Australopithecus itself. So when Australopithecus afarensis almost died out, you find a new Australopithecus coming up, and this, which is this one. This is called Australopithecus gari. Yes. Okay. Now, this kind of evidence tells you where one species ends and the other comes up, that there is a linear evolution. Correct? Yes, sir. Now, here we can say that Australopithecus gari came from Australopithecus afarensis because they were living before and then they came and started living after. Correct? Yes. But from this point onwards, if you see, around when Australopithecus gari ended, we find another Australopithecus evolving and rising which is Australopithecus boisei, right? Yes. This one. Yes. And now you can see that they have, like for a face, a small face, they, they started getting a slightly bigger brains, right? For the face. But also, let me tell you one more thing that is interesting. Look from 3.5 <clears throat> sorry not 3.5 this is 2.5 look from 2.5 million years to present uh, so, or to 1 million year here so look at this time frame okay which i have marked here yes sir and see how many species you can see that they shared the same time almost the same time and they were all present during the same time on earth okay I'll just take a quick break. I'll come from the washroom. Is it okay? okay. okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. sure. Yeah.
Okay, are you with my audible and visible? Yeah, cold. Yeah, okay, cool. So, yes, what did you notice from one to 2.5 million years ago in that period? What did you notice? So, I like six species, like shared the common thing, right? So, do you think all these six came after one from the other? Doesn't look like, right? Yes. Sir. Because around the same time, when Australopithecus fossil starts, we find we start finding their fossils in some other part of the world. We also find Homo habilis fossils, which is this one, right? We yeah. also find Australopithecus robustus fossils. We also find Homo, Homo yes. rudolfensis, which is Homo habilis, another Homo habilis. Yeah. We also find Homo ergaster, which is called Homo erectus now. And we also find the true Homo erectus during this time, right? Yes. Sir. So one, two, three, four, five, and six Homo species used to share the planet at one point of time, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, 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 all this, we, we do not study all of them in NCRT. So that's where people started thinking or uh, students have this misconception that, you know, they all came one after the other, which clearly is not true from fossil evidences. But what we should know is in terms of increasing brain capacities, it makes sense. So Australopithecus had the smallest brain capacity, just around 300 to 500, you know, cubic centimeters. Then when yes. Homo started, Homo habilis had around 700 to 900. And then Homo erectus had around 1000 to 1200. Then Homo heidelbergensis and Neanderthal, they look. So if you look from here onwards, like from here onwards, erectus, ergaster look less like humans, but erectus, can you see these teeth are now tapered? Yes, sir. And Neanderthal and Heidelbergensis look very much like humans, but still they are different, right? Yeah. This prominent ridge is still there in all. Ape-like ridge, which we don't have that much. Correct? Yes. And if you see the roundishness of the head where the brain lies, because of this part, so this, this region of the brain is called cortex. We have the biggest cortex for our brain. Humans have a biggest cortex. That's where all our intelligence and processing power comes from, which means we have three more cores of the CPU. That's it. Okay. If you want to understand, kind of like equivalent. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes, Mark. Yeah. yeah. We can process better. So then after Homo erectus, you still, you again will find when I was saying, so six between 1 million to 2.5 million, six homo species that we have evidences of. Now, this data is also not complete because we have found another one, uh, which is called Homo devsonians. Okay. Homo devsonians are not in this, this uh, image, but Homo devsonians come somewhere around Homo neanderthals and Homo sapiens. So now, doing the same thing, look from zero to around. 0 0.5 million. Look at this frame. How many species of humans can you find now? So from and where? From present mm. back to 0 0.5 million around. 0. Do you so see so any overlapping? Yes, there is still overlapping. Yeah. You can like... actually Homo erectus is the longest living human or ancestors of human, you can say on the planet. This, there are fossils you find from somewhere 1.9 million years ago to 0 0.3 million years ago. The longest span they rule because of one reason, which is which lies in their name. And that name is Homo erectus. Homo erectus were the first hominids who were able to stand erect on two feet. That's why they're called erectus. And just because they could stand erect, now their two hands are free. So they can hunt, they can make weapons, they can carry food with them. They will not die of hunger and thirst. They can carry water, they can make vessels. You, know? you understand? 
not vessels though they were not making much of vessels but they it allowed them to migrate to longer and longer and longer uh, distances and evade predation evade any kind of threat run away from danger all these things made homo erectus a very very successful species and the moment it started rising it wiped out almost everything back homo habilis were gone rudolfensis were gone australopithecus were gone right yes sir erectus made all these others go extinct same did homo sapiens which is this one when we started rising we made erectus go away we made heidelbergensis go away we made neanderthals extinct we also made devsonians extinct make sense yes sir we are the most evolved and if you see the cranial capacity of homo sapiens is around 1400 the only one species that had a bigger brain than us in the history was homo neanderthals now that's a kind of a dilemma homo neanderthals were having a brain around 100 cubic centimeter more than us can you see this so this is the only glitch in the data everything was going very fine we were boasted by ego we were very happy that oh we had the biggest brain but then it turns out to be oh oh neanderthals had bigger brain than us then why did we survived and they got extinct any idea yes sir so can you repeat sir can you see from this data from this graph that homo neander who neanderthals had a bigger brain than homo sapiens 100 yes. cubic centimeter bigger yes sir right then why did we survive and they got extinct because till now we were saying bigger the brain better it is right yeah why the bigger brains of neanderthals didn't help them so they might be heavy they might be heavy yeah so yeah. like the brain must be heavy or what yes the <laughs> you not able to call it such heavy it <laughs> <laughs> no no that's not so we still to be very honest we still don't know the correct answer but there are some theories which are being tested by some evidences that ne- there were there could be two reasons neanderthals um were not as diversely spread as homo sapiens when they came homo sapiens were very very migratory in their behavior this could be one reason because we find homo sapiens fossils from almost everywhere even from africa from where australopithecus arises and we believe that humans from africa uh, ancestors of human from africa came out to all the continents but when homo sapiens evolved they went back to africa and all, all other places as well that is one thing second could be that their brain might be big but that big brain might not have more neurons brain can also be big if it has more non neuronal tissue right neurons yes. give us more advantage of processing and doing things right neurons make us more intelligent so they might have been they might be having bigger brains but not that effective brains as homo sapiens so their intelligence might still be uh lower than homo sapiens those are some th- uh, things that scientists believe might be the reasons of neanderthals exist um, extinction okay yes so uh, is human evolution clear to you i think much more clearer in detail from than yes. from the textbook but in boards you have to write what's there in ncert mostly so just remember the key species now at the very end after i explain everything to you students i'll say that all the red smart species you have to worry about you have to worry about australopithecus africans the first one the fossils of which are found around 3 to 4 million years ago then from australopithecus you have to go to homo habilis okay then homo erectus homo neanderthal and homo sapiens okay so yes, we do not have any fossil evidence of ramapithecus 
We have, we have, but we, we are not taking Ramapithikas here. The, the timeline starts from four. Ramapithikas were 15 million years ago, long back. We do have evidences. Okay. And sir, like I wanted to ask, like in the brief account of evolution, sir, do we have to remember uh, the data by years, like 15 million uh, ago, there was ancestral just 16? Some, just some major ones. So let me go up and this one you are saying, right? Yes. Yeah. So, for example, for the evolution of plants, all you need to know is that before angiosperm became the most prominent plants on the planet, which is presently the planet is dominated by angiosperms. Uh, before that, in the Carboniferous, so Carboniferous period, remember, it is the most important period where life diverged a lot. It's called Carboniferous period because carbon-based life just popped up, blasted, expanded, usually. During that period, most of the plants on the planet were either or stales or ferns. Okay? Or stales, seed ferns, and these kind of plants. The angiosperms were very tiny fraction. Can you see this narrow chain going up? Yes, sir. Yeah. So they were very, very minor. And only after the Cretaceous period, Cretaceous period is where dinosaurs got extinct. It's called KT extinction. And after dinosaurs were gone, you will see that around the Cretaceous period only here, which is this period, a sudden boom in the angiosperm population started and now they are the widest branch which means the most diverse plant type on the planet that's all okay and if you can remember these ancestors in series everything started with chlorophyte ancestors the word chlorophyte means they had chlorophyll like molecules and they were capable of doing photosynthesis that is the whole basis of calling plants plants right because they can photosynthesize and chlorophyte ancestors directly gave birth to bryophytes. So bryophytes are the kind of oldest plants on the planet. They directly come from the chlorophyte ancestors, a branch of it. And they also started rising in the Carboniferous period. You will see almost everything started rising after Carboniferous period, right? Or yes. during Carboniferous period. That's it. Not much to know about in this and is it clear Arpit? Yes, any... yeah in the animals again just remember that this graph starts at 350 million years ago which means it only starts from the early reptiles this graph does not constitutes fish and amphibians so from early reptiles the most important thing that you have to remember is that around 300 million years ago, I'm so sorry. Okay. Yes. Around 300 million years ago, if you will pay attention, there was a divergence of the early reptilian. One group diverged to become synapsids the other called sauropsids. The word saur means lizard. So dinosaur means, you won't mind me eating a chocolate, right? No issues. Hmm. Dinosaur, it has the word saur. So it means huge lizards, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Synapsids went on who became the ancestors of therapsids. So after synapsids, you have to remember therapsids. Everything else in between is extinct now. Even therapsids are extinct, but therapsids, which looked nothing like the present mammals, they were very different from present mammal. Actually, they are the ancestors of all the mammals, including us on the planet, therapsids. 
is it clear yes sir yeah. and then sauropsids then diverged into multiple things so synapsids gave rise to mammals very late and let me tell you an interesting thing about evolution <clears throat> that we have evidences for now uh, hello fatima fatima just joined in we still have some time to discuss hi sir hi how are you i'm so sorry for being late i had another class how did it go it was good alhamdulillah we were uh, doing question yeah. papers chemistry very good ah very good um we are just discussing evolution we have this is like a revision class or it's like a revision clearing. yeah it's okay. doubt clearing and revision class so arpit had doubt with evolution so we started with human evolution went with the cranial capacity how different humans used to live on the planet and what are the evidences and all and then i'm just telling what to what to remember from these uh, evolutionary history charts okay so we have discussed about plant we are currently discuss about discussing about this graph okay. is that is that okay fatima uh, yes sir. thank you very much yeah Yes, so I was saying that what you have to remember is this, that this graph, which is an NCRT, this di diagram or chart, whatever you say, it starts from early reptiles. It does not account for amphibians and fish, okay, their evolution. It will be a very messy graph if you include those, but from early reptiles, clearly we have evidences, fossil evidences to say mammals came different. We say that from fish, uh, came amphibians and reptiles and mammals diverged a little from reptiles and were form, uh, evolved independently. So this synapsid branch that formed pelicosaurs, which are now extinct, pelicosaurs still are like lizards, like reptiles, but they are extinct, they were cold-blooded. And somewhere between pelicosaur and therapsids, this change happened. <laughs> Mammals we know are warm-blooded organisms. Reptiles are cold-blooded, right? So we can regulate our body temperature. So therapsids were the are the earliest known ancestors of all the mammals on the planet right now. When mammals started rising up, mammals were mostly nocturnal. You know what are nocturnal? What does nocturnal means? They sleep at night and. Be awake at the morning. No, or the opposite. Opposite. yeah, it's the opposite. They are active in the night. That's why they get they are called nocturnal, and they sleep throughout the day. All the mammals started as nocturnal organisms because they could not compete or they could not live without threat in the rep reptilian era. So when reptiles used to rule the planet, which is like dinosaurs and their their ancestors, mammals were just living in burrows. And they were very, very small, like shrews and mouse. That's why mouse is still nocturnal. That's why when you all go to sleep, and if you have mouse in your house, that mouse will become active in the night. When you are sleeping in your bedrooms, it will start exploring the kitchen and find food. So mouse is nocturnal. And mouse are our very distant relic, uh, ancestors not ancestors, but we and mouse shared similar ancestors very, very long back in time, somewhere around Therapsid, this, this time, Jurassic and Cretaceous, between this time. And that's why this habit of being active in the night is there in mammals. Many mammals then started going back to a diurnal state, but that only happened after dinosaurs extinction in this period, which is called tertiary to quaternary period. When dinosaurs were extinct, our mammals got a chance to rule the planet. And then these big mammals could evolve. They could start hunting in the day because now there are no uh, apex predators to hunt them. So this behavioral change came later on. Okay, but mouse... So um, how did the dinosaurs get extinct? Got extinct? Yeah. So the most, the most accepted... Um, theory on the basis of evidences that we currently have is the climate change plus this asteroid collision theory. So many scientists believe that just an asteroid which hits one part of the earth cannot lead to extinction of all the reptiles everywhere on the planet because 
if that asteroid hit the earth and earth stayed intact it could not split the earth into two that asteroid was not very very huge right yeah. and it will only impact one face of the earth how did the dinosaurs which were on the other face let's say there is a dinosaur in the american mainland which is now america let's say dinosaurs roaming in new york they were hit by asteroids so why did the dinosaurs roaming in india pakistan region how did they got extinct right yeah so scientists science is that's why science is brilliant because you you argue and counter argue even with scientists only you know because that's all what scientists do and find evidences for so they said yes it's a very good very good point there's no there's no space for ego or personal domination in science so if i say that asteroid uh, killed all the dinosaurs you may just stand up and say but with due respect i have a question how do you think if asteroid hit the other side of the uh, of of the earth lost dinosaurs then it's a good point so then on the basis of mathematical simulation so now because we have technology we do not need to repeat this experiment by bringing an asteroid and hitting it in earth what we can do is we can simulate what happens when an asteroid of this mass hits the earth so how much of smoke fire dust particle will be in the atmosphere and the simulations mathematical model then fossil records fossil record do suggest so and if there was such an collision where is the crater right there should be a very big crater on the planet if such a huge asteroid came and hit the earth which extincted all the dinosaurs it could not be a small bus size asteroid or a car size asteroid right yeah. it has to be something really big at least uh, you know half a city size asteroid right so where yes. is the crater so they started finding the evidence for the crater and they found one in i think the pacific or atlantic ocean so at the ocean bed because that crater is not visible to our eye so that collision happened in the um earth water junction and there is a very huge crater um let me figure out what is which one is expected to be that uh let me figure out the name so it's called a uh, chicxulub crater okay let me write this name here you can figure it out yourself this is what scientists now believe uh, around 66 million years ago and it was 6 miles in diameter and there is a crater which is estimated to be 180 kilometers in diameter so 180 kilometers of diameter of a crater is a big crater right it's a huge crater and this is that crater it is in the Yuc- yucatan peninsula in mexico buried underneath the yucatan peninsula in mexico and some part of it is in the land so it looks like a plateau a peninsula or mountain range but then scientists realize oh this is not a mountain range this is actually a big crater so this is how it this is a artistic version of it but this is how it looks if you can if you can see it can you see it see this i am not sure if you can see this yes so yes so it's visible yeah so i'm writing the name you yeah. can figure it out it's called um, c h i c chicxulub x u l u b chicxulub crater okay so it is named after a community a kind of tribe which is called chicxulub community because they live in that region where this particular thing is okay it it is and it, the impact was huge because it goes around 20 kilometers deep in the earth like the depth is 20 wow. km and the width of the diameter is 180 km so this is what the expert but so the uh, same question comes no if it is in one place how does it uh, affect the other uh, how does yeah. it affect the dinosaurs of the other exactly they're coming they're coming to that yeah so but that tells that okay the first proof that you needed to test this theory was there has to be a crater so there is a crater 
Second thing is that impact has to be huge. So looking at the diameter and the width, the impact was huge. Third thing is by mathematical simulations, scientists have proved that such a huge impact will lead to a lot of dust and smoke go into the atmosphere. And this will be yeah. so huge that it will not settle for if not years, then for many months at least. So simulation says that the dust which will go into the air will shield, it will look, it will be like a foggy evening for around three to four years constantly. So much of dust. First, it will be all total darkness because so much of debris is in the atmosphere that sunlight will not reach the planet effectively. But that's only in that area, right? Where no, the but, crater is. But the earth is rotating, right? That's the simulation. Um, when you don't, you, you, you don't, we don't see that the atmosphere which is in front of India will always be in front of India, right? Yeah. You understand my point? If that would have been the thing, countries would have been happier that Australia's pollution is in Australia only and America's pollution is in America yeah. only, right? So we don't care. You can do your pollution, smoke your own pollution, but that's not how it works. Global warming, airs get diffused all throughout. So these are mathematical simulations, of course, and ideas uh, which are based on logic, which says that first the impact killed a lot of a lot of directly a lot of dinosaurs. Second, the rest of the dinosaurs, because they were reptiles, they were all cold-blooded. To actively hunt, they need to depend on sunlight to warm their body, just like all the reptiles now do, right? So a loss. Yeah. A lot of loss of reptilian life happened during that that uh, meteor, um, sorry, that asteroid collision okay. because of climate change. So that's the theory. Asteroid collision coupled with climate change that killed all the dinosaurs. So the climate changed for many years and it favored warm-blooded organisms over reptiles. So dinosaurs started dying of hunger, disease, malnutrition and all. Okay. Yes, sir. Makes sense. At least what we in our limited capacity can figure out. Because we know that there were dinosaurs. We know that they are not, not there anymore. So what happened in between is a thing of research. So people come with theories, try to test it, make simulations, find uh, evidences in nature. And this is how we build these theories. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay, perfect. So after dinosaurs got, were extinct, you should remember that in the tertiary and quaternary mammals and birds, so even some reptiles like crocodile, you can see that turtles are one of the, just like bryophytes, turtles directly came from sauropsids. So they are shelled organisms, that's why. So the question is, when dinosaurs got extinct, how did other reptiles, so there are reptiles which lived with dinosaurs, they survived, but others could not. So all these dinosaurs, uh, all these reptiles which survived were the ones living in water, ocean water, okay? Mostly or in the burrow. So crocodiles survived. Crocodiles are as old as, you can see this branch going. The ancestors of crocodile are very old, right? Even older than dinosaurs when they extinct. Sir? So, yes. Do we have any record of that flying dinosaurs? <laughs> we do have. We do have. In fact, the 11th class NCRT, biology NCRT, I think the cover picture is of Archaeopteryx. It's 12th. Oh, it's 12th. Okay, so you're only. Archaeopteryx is the flying dinosaur. The connecting it's link between. It's not the cover page. Uh, at the okay. back, it is there. Oh, it's the back page. Okay. Back but cover. it's a very, very tiny picture. Oh, I see. So I think, but it's there in on Google. Is there on Google? Yeah, you can Google Archaeopteryx, and you will see Archaeopteryx is the flying dinosaur. There were many. This is just one. Um, there were many flying dinosaurs at the time. Uh, recently, I was studying an article yesterday, which talked about um, Hemizygopteryx. So Hemizygopteryx was another flying dinosaur, but it used to hunt near the water bodies. And the mouth part. So have you seen these, these uh, cranes or pelicans, sorry. Have you seen pelicans? They have a very, they have a beak. They are birds. They have beak. 
but in their lower beak there were huge bag like structure like this yes yes have you seen this kind of yes. birds they can store a lot of things in their that's called pelicans yeah. one second just one second so they think that hemis agopteryx was one of a very huge flying dinosaur with a pelican like pouch and that was so huge the skull of that dinosaur was so huge that a normal sized human a 6 foot human can easily just jump in and sit in the pouch it's so huge yeah, yeah. so that's that's what they estimate from the size of the skull so a human would just be like this just sit in the pelican <laughs> it it actually used to hunt a lot of big fish so what it will do it will fly come to the water and while flying any fish which is on the surface of the water it will just skim off and take that in the pelican and fly away the archaeopteryx is smaller than this uh... archaeopteryx is very small comparatively yes yeah. they, are, they are bigger as compared to humans they are very big but these which i am talking about the article which i was studying yesterday they are huge so there were the idea is to say that there were many flying dinosaurs and archaeopteryx is the connecting link between a reptile and a bird so the question everyone asked about this branching i have written here also so this branch where scientists claim that birds evolved from reptiles where is the proof you can't just keep saying everything right give the proof so you give theory you find the proof or you first find the proof and based on that proof define theory or make theories this is how science works so the proof is archaeopteryx and archaeopteryx had beak like birds which is a birds feature and inside the beak it had teeth small sharp teeth like reptile it had feathers on the back of the body and it has also scales on the neck region so scales are mixture. exactly so scales are a feature of reptiles but feathers are a feature of bird so that's how we figured out the link and we know that and birds also happen to be warm blooded so mammals and bird both are warm blooded so people used to think did mammals evolve from birds which is very very uncertain because if mammals evolved from birds our ancestors were flying and we stopped flying it's like a loss of function right so people were puzzled because the only link was reptiles are cold blooded birds and mammal are warm blooded they can regulate their body temperature but then it doesn't make sense if our ancestors could fly why did they stop flying but it happens even in birds there are flightless birds like ostrich and emu but then the better evidence came that no birds and mammals are very distant no relation it just happened that both of them evolved the the uh, the ability to adapt oh, sorry ability to regulate their body temperatures and it, it, not in the exactly same manner so there are different mechanism for a bird to regulate its body temperature and a mammal that we now know from research and we realize that birds evolved from reptiles and mammals evolved separately so that's the whole yes okay. so like i have a question that mm -hmm. like can homo sapiens now undergo evolution and can evolve into a new species of course we are undergoing evolution every decade by decade century by century uh we cannot say the homo sapiens that lived 30000 years ago and the ones who started farming were exactly like us they were very different from us homo sapiens any every life form on earth is undergoing evolution if evolution stops then you know adaptability so, variation stops that's so, not happen so but the physical anatomy structure will not change you know it might we lost appendix appendix was once a functional organ in our ancestors in us appendix does not serve function people used to feel that appendix is completely useless but that's not true appendix is useful in some ways now we are realizing by research that appendix hold some very vital keys elements for our gut immunity so removing appendix you know what is appendix appendix vermiform the last so part of the cellulose it was used to yeah, of course at one point of time it used to produce cellulase so in herbivores there is still a very very functional appendix producing cellulase but in humans it's not okay 
So we are undergoing uh, anatomical changes. It's not like we are not. Um, uh, you know that uh, when you when you wake up in the morning, uh, when you wash your face, you realize that there is some we call it the sand of the eye that gets deposited at these two junctions, right? It's like a mucus. Yes, sir. Yes, Where sir. does it comes from? Why do we have mucus in our eyes? Because go to the go to mirror and look your eyes carefully. You will see that there are remnants. That is the that is the pore. That is the tear pore. That's not what I'm talking about. But mm -hmm. there is a remnant at the very end, like this. If this is the eye, I'm not very good at making eye. But at here, can you understand what I'm making here? This is an eye. At this pore, you will see that there is a remnant of a fold, a skin fold. You will see reddish in color. That is the remnant of nictitating membrane, which mammals uh, got from reptilian ancestors. So when pelicosaurs were there, synapsids evolved, all reptiles have nictitating membrane. So crocodiles, when they go in the water, they don't close their eyes. They just put one membrane over their eyes like a goggle, water goggle. When humans go to water, they wear the water goggle, right? Reptiles so have their own water gun. Because of that one little tiny thing? Yes. It, so in, in them, it is a fully functional membrane. So let me show you a very, very fantastic video if I have time. Uh, and you will be, if you have not seen it by now, there are mesmerizing things. Um, closing, nictitating. Just, just. Type closing nictitating membrane video. So in many reptiles, it has been shot. What, how does it function? I'll tell you. Um, yes, slow motion. This is a slow motion video of, let me, I think I can show it to you by sharing the screen also. Let me stop sharing the screen and then share it with you. Another screen. <clears throat> so YouTube. The only thing I don't show a lot of videos in class is because of copyright issues. I don't know which things are copyright and not, but so you can give credits. Yeah, I did some once I got flagged also. That's why. So yeah, this one. Okay. Let me share this screen. Can you all see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. What do you see? This is a crocodile's eye. Okay. In slow motion, what? So you see this eye and this is the eyelid, right? Just like yes. us, we have eyelid. They don't have hairs on the eyelids like these. What are they called? Uh, Eyelashes. Eyelashes, they don't have eyelashes. They have scales, right? No skin. So this can close. When this closes, the eye closes. They go to sleep. But look what is happening apart from that. Yeah, it's, it's, it is cool. Do you see something? Something came. Yes. Like a membrane. Let me, let me mute this video and then, yeah. Let's first see in the fast motion. Pay attention to this part, okay? This part of the eye where my cursor is. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? Yeah. Now in slow motion, can you see it going back? See, see, like a windshield coming. Why is it going back? Because it's coming. in water right now. It's outside. It is just cleaning the eyes. Oh, okay. Like a viper. So that thing, I'll, I'll, oh, it goes very fast. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, so sorry for the ad, people. Yes. I think this is another video that talks about. So he's just explaining. Let's see what he's saying, okay? Can you all hear the can you all hear the audio? Yes, sir. Okay, let's see what he's saying. 
Uh, most people may already know that crocodilians have three eyelids. So we all understand what that means. We actually have two eyelids. We have one that closes from the top and one that closes from the bottom. Crocodilians also have two eyelids that close from the top and the bottom, but they also have a third eyelid called a nictitating membrane that closes from the front to the back. And this eyelid it actually protects their eyes when they're underwater exploring. This here is our wonderful freshwater crocodile, Johnson's crocodile, who uh, let me take this awesome video of our third eyelid. Hope you enjoy. Okay, so do you see this reddish thing here? It has blood vessels. Yes, sir. it's so weird. It's it's called nictitating membrane. We have remnants of nictitating membrane at our eyes towards the nose nasal part on both the sides. If you go to mirror and see, just do this, like lower your lower eyelid, and you will see that there is a remnant of that nictitating membrane in mammals, like in humans as well. This also tells us that evolution makes all the sense. Why we have an ictitating membrane? Because we are not water organisms, right? We don't need to cov uh, cover our eyes like this. So why do we have that? Why our embryos have a tail when we don't have a tail? Why our embryos have a gill slit when we do have, don't we have lungs? So these are the questions that we puzzled scientists. And that's where we started finding uh, pieces of that puzzle, started making the theory of evolution. Okay. <clears throat> 